to the so so anyway we're switching gears now we're going to look at plants a bit and uh, I'm I'm going to tell you a story it's going to be a general uh, very old story something that happened happened in the Paleozoic and that would be the origin of land plants and a bit about the diversi the early diversification of land plants and so this quote from Darwin is one that I'm surprised I haven't seen yet, but it really captures why I have devoted my life to solving these uh, ancient mysteries. Um, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So again, this talk is about plants. And my favorite um, quote, or favorite description of plants is one by Nicholas from 1997. And he says that plants are living things that strive without intention, build without blood or brain, move without muscle, summon without self-awareness, and feed the world without intent. And it's feeding the world without intent that really is why the evolu evolution of plants is so important. And, and I would argue to you that the transmigration of algae, green algae from water to land, was one of the most, if not the most important event that occurred in the evolution of terrestrial life. Because it opened the way for other organisms to follow, to diversify, including humans, and as we're going to see later in the talk, millipedes. So this is what the earth looked like at the time that uh, algae left the water and conquered the, the land masses. There weren't very many land masses and they were moving. The, the plate tectonics, a lot of uh, activity, tectonic activity was going on. There was high CO2, uh, about three times the level that it is now. Oxygen levels were low, about half of what, um, what is in the air right now. The, uh, the land masses were uninhabited, nothing living there. There were shallow fresh water uh, bodies all distributed along the land. And uh, just to give you some reference point, let's see, how do I point? This here. Right about here is where Illinois was <laughs> in, sh in shallow water. So Illinois was still underground, but, but much of the United States wa was above the ground. And there's this huge land mass that is rapidly moving that will eventually become the southern land mass, Gondwana. Gondwana. <laughs> Gondwana, sorry. So we know that the green algae are the ancestors to land plants and that it was really freshwater algae that made the, the, the um, movement from water to land. And there were two major groups of algae, the caryophytes on the right in the freshwater and the chlorophytes. And we know that the caryophytes are the ancestors for a, a lot of reasons, molecular, morphological. A lot of it is cellular data. Um, and a good bit on the flagella of the cells. Um, and so the caryophytes, in these ancient seas, and I mean, sorry, not seas, but uh, fresh water bodies um, about 540 million years ago were diversifying. And within uh, 100 million years, um, a new life form had evolved. That would be green life on land. And you can see that they slowly, you can, they were creeping up and, and uh, um, evolving into very odd looking plants that I'm going to talk a little bit more about here in a second. So again, we know that the Caryophycian algae are the ancestors, or the um, living ancestors to the land plants. And they, at this point, we, we still have not resolved which of the Caryophycian algae is, is the closest living ancestor. And uh, it seems that about 10 years ago, we were all fixated on uh, the Caryophytes, the Caryales. We all knew that they, that was the answer, that the Caryales 
were the, the closest living relatives of, of land plants. And since then, it's a, it's a matter of the more data we have, the less we know. It now um, has become questionable. And in fact, in the last five years, I've listed three papers up there, each concluding a different algal group is the uh, living ancestor of the land plant. And so by the Silurian, the land masses were ripe for invasion. Um, CO2 levels were high. Oxygen levels were a little bit higher. And by that time, there were large uh, bodies of fresh water on the land. And a, a great diversity of these green algae. The, um, we know that there were lichens on land so the, and other organisms that were building soil. So it, it, was, it was a perfect environment. The, o, the ozone level was great enough that, land, that the plants would be uh, protected, out, um, exposed, and out of the water. So millions of tiny organisms were slowly evolving characteristics that would enable them to live in the air, which was a very stressful environment. So what I want to do for you today is approach two questions that are fundamental to the evolution of living organisms. And they are, what do the first land plants look like? And what plants of today are they related to? But in order to do that, I got to give you a little biology lesson. And I have to teach you about the life cycle of land plants. Now, all land plants have a life cycle whereby they have a, an alternation of generations, two multicellular generations. One generation is responsible for making the gametes. And this is called the gametophyte, or the, it's gamete-producing generation. And the gametes being the egg and sperm cells. And yes, indeed, these are plant egg and sperm. Sperm cells of plants are multicellular, um, modal, I mean, sorry, multiflagellated, modal, and very oddly coiled, highly diverse. But that's, that's another story that I'm not going to talk about today. And the other generation is the sporophyte generation, or the spore-producing generation. And it is the sporophyte generation that was the innovation of land plants simply meaning that that generation evolved when plants made it to land, and it, that generation does not exist in the algae. Okay, so it is a sporophyte generation that was critical to the survival of plants on land, and partly because of the fact that the sporophyte generation produces spores, and spores are highly resistant structures. They're surrounded by a, a extremely resistant biopolymer called uh, sporopollenin. And spores were critical to dispersal of the plants and to survival over, over adverse periods. OK, so it's a sporophyte generation that is important. And um, if we look at the sporophyte generation, we can divide the plants up into two main groups. And they are the bryophytes and the rest of the plants, the tracheophytes. Bryophytes are very different from the rest of the plants because the sporophyte is attached to the gametophyte always. So the gametophyte in this image is the leafy plant here. And this is a sporophyte. This is a, the bryophyte tachachia. And the sporophyte only um, has a single spore-producing structure. It is never independent of the gametophyte. In the other land plants, the tracheophytes, or polysporangiate plants, the sporophyte is, is a large plant. It's the plant that you see. And the gametophyte is very small. But the deal with the sporophyte is that, sorry, wrong way, is that it produces lots and lots of sporangia. So we refer to these plants as polysporangiate. Bryophytes are monosporangiate, having only one sporangium. Okay, so 
This is important to understand in, um, when we look at the early land plants. So keep this in mind. The, the tracheophytes having many sporangia on the plant that's dominant, the, the bryophytes having only a single sporangium, and it terminates the stalk. It is always, in the bryophytes, always the sporophyte is connected to the gametophyte. Okay, so the accepted hypothesis on the relationships uh, among the land plants is that, again, we have a Carophycian alga that is the ancestor, and that the bryophytes were the first to diverge, and they diverged in a stepwise fashion. And this is a typical branching order that we see uh, resolved nowadays with the liverworts, mosses, hornworts, and then the tracheophytes. So bryophytes evolved first. They were uh, around for quite a long period of time before tracheophytes, yet there's a problem. And the problem is that the fossil record does not um, support this hypothesis. And that simply means that the first land plants that um, you see in the fossil record are <coughs> described as polysporangiates. They're described as tracheophytes, not bryophytes. And we have no large fossils of plants, early land plants, that are uh, thought to be bryophytes or of bryophyte affinity. So we have a problem. In fact, the, there are no real bryophyte fossils that are, have been described that um, are uh, concurrent, that have lived with tra the tracheophytes uh, until many, many, many years after the diversification of the tracheophytes, as much as 70 million years. And these plants look like the living bryophytes. So in telling my story of the, the first land plants, I am going to integrate two um, living bryophytes uh, and to tell you a little bit about these, the, the two bryophytes are Hapometrium, which is the oldest living liverwort, and Tachachia, which is the oldest living moss, and the images of the two plants on the right. So the first evidence of land plants are of spores. And I could refer to this as the age of spores because this lasted for at least 50 million years. So there were spores, and there were all kinds of spores. And we know they're land plants because they have spore pollen in around them. And um, they, they have uh, the basic organization of land plant spores. So there is a story based on the spores I don't have time to talk about. But these spores existed before we find any macrofossils, before we find any real plants for millions and millions of years. And, and that is a bit of a problem. <laughs> it's led um, some people to suggest that maybe spores came before the sporophyte, which, again, is another story. But the first macrofossils or megafossils were of very small plants that um, we see in the Silurian. They were not more than a couple of centimeters tall, about this, this big maximum. They were simply stems that branched and had terminal sporangia, so spore-bearing structures at the tips of these branches. And here's some reconstructions on the right of uh, the genus Cooksonia. This on the left is the actual fossil of the plant. And these are described as tracheophytes. They're described as polysporangias because indeed they have many sporangia on a single plant. And this is a reconstruction of a, a forest of miniature plants of uh, Cooksonia-like plants that evolved, radiated pretty quickly after the first appearance of, of those plants in the mid-Silurian. Um, just for reference, on the bottom right is an image of, of the animals that existed, and at this point in time, there were no terrestrial animals. All of the animals, and they were quite diverse, in, were in the oceans, in, in, in water. So again, plants, 
made that movement to land, and it took some time before the animals followed. And this is another example of a very simple plant uh, among the first to um, be found in the fossil record. And this is Agliophyton, again, a branching stem with terminal sporangia. All thought to be tracheophytes, polysporangiates, and that has been that way in, in textbooks forever. It is um, conventional wisdom. It is highly accepted. But we started taking a fresher look at fossils. And we started challenging this idea that these early fossils were, in fact, tracheophytes. And we started thinking, maybe we're looking for bryophytes in the wrong way. And we question, what if, if we would, would consider the bryophytes, the, those gametophytes, as uh, plants that don't have leaves, what would we be looking for in the fossil record? Um, okay, so with that thought in mind, we could now consider these fossils as bryophytes, in that instead of these being sporophytes with terminal sporangia, we interpreted rather that this part of the plant was a gametophyte, sorry, a gametophyte with these terminal uh, structures being the whole sporophyte. In other words, a sporophyte inserted into the gametophyte and this single sporangium being that monosporangium of a sporophyte, of a bryophyte. So each one of these being a separate sporophyte, and here, this reconstruction here, separate sporophytes, similar to what we see in Takakia. Here is a junction, the juncture between the sporophyte and the gametophyte. And if you pull these leaves off, this would look very much like a stem that perhaps right here in this reconstruction would be where the two generations would meet, okay? And similarly, in this, this <coughs> population, to, this Takakia, if we took all the leaves off of this gametophyte, these branching sporophytes at the tip of, sh of these shoots that are gametophytes would look very much like this reconstruction. But the only difference is the shape of the, of the uh, sporangium, which is highly variable in, in the fossils um, anyway. So the same thing with haplometrium, strip off the leaves. With no leaves, it looks like then um, there's the gametophyte, and it would just gradually ease into the sporophyte with the terminal uh, sporangium. So that was also... The, uh, the case with uh, Aglaia phyton, and especially with the fact that many of the bryophytes, at least the, the, more, the less derived bryophytes, have a rhizomatous uh, base, as you can see in Hapometrium, as does the reconstruction of Aglaia phyton. So, again, Hapometrium, if we strip off the leaves here, we see that this gametophyte would look like a, a sporophyte with terminal sporangia, but really it is a gametophyte with um, a whole sporophyte attached to it. And so our new interpretation is that the common ancestor to all land plants was indeed uh, an extinct bryophyte that had no leaves and, and had it attached sporophyte or spore-producing generations at the tips of these shoots of the gametophyte. And once we dig deeper into the fossils, we see that there are numerous fossils that support this concept. And this fossil of Tordocollis from, uh, published in 1978 from the Upper Silurian. Yes, indeed, these plants Many, many images of so-called terminal sporangia on branched axes look exactly like Takakia and support that concept. So much so that if you look at this particular specimen, you can see where 
this could well be where the two generations meet, this being a sporophyte and this being the gametophyte. Again, stripping off the leaves. Similarly, here in the, in the living tachachia, here is where the gametophyte ends and the sporophyte uh, <coughs> begins. And so, in sort of conclusion, it was Darwin who taught us to, to look at things anew and not to accept what, uh, um, what conventional wisdom or what the thought of the day was, that preconceived notions limit our understanding and even keep us from the truth. And so I fast forward into the uh, Devonian, through the Devonian, into the Carboniferous, and you can see the land masses are changing quickly, m much movement towards the north, um, and the southern landmass, Gondwana, is uh, shaping nicely. And in the Carboniferous, then the Plants had become highly diverse. They were very large, um, and there were massive swamps, beautiful, lush rainforests that covered the land masses. And this is a reconstruction of, of what those forests look like. And everything in those forests, all the plants, all the animals were, were giant. None of these plants live today. All of their relatives are extremely small. So these trees are all extinct, and um, the plants that they gave rise to, extremely small, and, and, and well, um, highly diverse too. But to give you an example of how large some of the organisms were, this is a reconstruction of a millipede from the Carboniferous. And so it wasn't just the plants that were large, it was animals and, and many, many insects too, um, including huge dragonflies. And by this time, the amphibians and um, reptiles had evolved. And so the Carboniferous is a, um, something that we have a good representation from in Illinois with M Mazon Creek and a recently discovered uh, underground river from the Carboniferous that uh, runs about two miles and exists about 250 feet below the surface um, that is really only miles from here. But all of that is a, is a, a topic of, of, a, of another story that we'll have to wait for a different time and place. Thank you.